Ladies and gentlemen, signori e signori, first of all, I apologize for a little delay, but these are the unexpected issues of uh, matching virtual and real life. So, so anyway, I would like to welcome all of you who are following us uh, from home. And I warmly welcome our friends who uh, joined us here today. And thank you for complying with all our uh, health and safety protocols, as well for accepting all the limitations and uh, precautionary measures that uh, these times still impose. And talking about this, I must say that seeing after 20 months of silence, seeing this uh, hall uh, again, lively again, uh, it's a very special emotion, uh, something very, um, very important for us. It's also a pleasure to uh, renew our cooperation with uh, iRicerca, with the iRicerca chapter. Uh, iRicerca is the International Association of Italian Researchers. And today we dedicate this uh, webinar of our series of scientific uh, lectures and webinars to uh, quantum information science. It will be held by two uh, outstanding researchers at Fermilab, uh, which is the America's Particles and um, Accel uh, sorry, <laughs> Accelerator Laboratory, where it's located in Batavia, where teams of international scientists try to, and here I quote, solve the mysteries of matter, energy, space, and time. I would like, therefore, to uh, introduce uh, Marco Mambelli from the Scientific Computing Division at Fermilab, who will moderate uh, the discussion and the Q&A afterwards. And then our uh, distinguished guests and speakers tonight, Dr. Silvia Zorzetti, Senior Researcher at Fermilab, Deputy Head of the Co-Design Department at the National Quantum Information Science Research Center at the Superconducting Quantum Materials and Systems Division, and deputy leader of the Ecosystem and Workforce Development Trust for the SQMS Center. Thank you, Silvia, for being with us, for having accepted our invitation. And then Dr. Mattia Cecchin, deputy head of the Quantum Materials and Qubits Department and leader of the Materials for Quantum Devices Group. Thank you and welcome, Mattia. So before diving into uh, the mysteries of space, matter, and time, uh, I still need to um, remind you that this webinar has been recorded. Uh, it will be therefore available on YouTube in a couple of days on our uh, YouTube channel, and uh, it's being streamed live on, on Facebook. To the, all the participants here, uh, I will invite you to uh, wear your mask and face coverings at all times. And a little procedure for the Q&A. Of course, who is following us from home will still be able to type the question using the Q&A tab, while people who are here are requested to go at the microphone and speak at the microphone their question, hold, keeping the mask on, so that people at home will be able to hear you. Thank you very much, and I leave the floor uh, to Marco. Good evening, everyone uh, in the room and at home. Thank you for joining us today uh, for another webinar organized by Ayricerca Chicago chapter in collaboration with the Italian Cultural Institute of Chicago. I would like to welcome uh, um, everyone uh, here in uh, the room and uh, at home, the members of the uh, cultural centers and uh, of Iri Cerca who joined from Chicago and from, from around the world. Uh, I would like to thank the director and the staff of the Institute for supporting our association and our outreach uh, activities and for bravely accepting uh, when we suggested to have this hybrid seminar today. Uh, Iri Cerca, for uh, who doesn't know it, uh, it's an international association of Italian researchers that aims to boost uh, the interaction between Italian researcher and uh, um, uh, yeah, sorry, with Italian researchers uh, from different disciplines and uh, to promote uh, science uh, uh, outreach to the general public. Uh, I would like to um, um, invite you, if you want to know more information, to check our website, uh, iricerca.org. 
Today, I have uh, the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Silvia Tortetti and Dr. Mattia Kekin. Uh, Silvia uh, is a senior engineer at the uh, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. She is currently deputy head uh, um, for the co-design department uh, at the National Quantum Information Science Research Center, um, superconducting uh, quantum materials and uh, uh, system uh, division. She's also a deputy leader uh, for the Ecosystem and Workforce Development Trust for the SQMS Center. She joined Fermilab in uh, 2017 after obtaining her uh, PhD in uh, electronic engineering and information technology from the University of Pisa. And uh, after being uh, Maria uh, Sklodowska uh, Curie Fellow at the uh, European Council for Nuclear Research, CERN. Mattia Kekin is deputy uh, head of the quantum material and the qubits department uh, and uh, leader of the material for quantum devices group. He graduated at the University of Padua uh, with a bachelor and master in material science and completed his first level master at the University of Padua in collaboration with uh, LNL and ENFN specializing in the field of uh, super, superconducting uh, radio frequency. He then moved to Chicago in 2014 to pursue a PhD in physics um, at the Illinois Institute of Technology, carrying uh, his experimental work at Fermilab and focusing on fundamental limiting factor for uh, superconducting radio frequency resonators. He was a postdoc at Fermilab, won the uh, People's Fellowship appointment and began working as an associate scientist in uh, applied physics and superconducting technology division. In 2020, he joined uh, uh, the newly formed superconducting quantum materials and system division. So, um, I think uh, we'll start our presentation. And Okay. Thank you very much, Marco. And thank you very much to the Institute for inviting us here to, to give this talk. So, uh, okay. Wait. okay, so today we're going to discuss about superconducting quantum materials and system uh, centered at Fermilab. So first of all, I want to introduce Fermilab. So Fermilab is the US particle physics and accelerator laboratory. And the vision of Fermilab is to solve the mysteries of matter, energy, space, and time for the benefit of all. So we, we have a lot of programs. So we work uh, specifically on high energy physics. So neutrino science and particle accelerators. And uh, we, we work on the development of uh, particle accelerators and particle colliders. And um, we, we try to push as much as possible the physics uh, uh, for particle physics, basically. And um, so the mission of Fermilab is trying to discover the, uh, the, the building blocks of, um, of, of, uh, of the matter, basically that uh, uh, of which we are made of. And, um, and we want to develop uh, technology, not only in particle accelerators, but also in quantum information science as we're gonna to discuss today. And um, okay, so let's, let's go into quantum information science specifically, let's discuss about the superconducting quantum materials and system center. So SQMS, as we call it, uh, has a mission. So to bring together the power of national labs, industry and academia in order to achieve transformational advantage in the major cross-cutting challenge of understanding and eliminating the coherence mechanism in superconducting 2D and 3D devices. Um, with the goal of enabling construction and deployment of super quant uh, superior quantum computer systems uh, for computing and sensing. And uh, so SQMS then is a, is a center. We have many collaborators. Fermilab is the leading institution. Then we have our uh, main uh, um, industrial partner that is irrigated computing, that is a uh, uh, a company from uh, the Bay Area that is specializing in quantum information science. Uh, and then we have many collaborators uh, such as uh, Northwestern University and National Labs, uh, NIST, but also international collaborators such as INFN. So we're in directly contact with uh, 
uh, with the Italian Institute for Nuclear Physics. And you can see here in these slides the various collaborations that we have. I'm not going to uh, uh, present the, uh, them all. So uh, this is how the center looks like. Uh, it's spread around the whole country here in the US, plus Italy, of course. And so you can see here that we, we are working with uh, basically the whole continent. So it, it's, it's really exciting. And uh, the idea is to have uh, an innovation chain within the center. So we're going to work on materials in order to discover new materials or uh, make better materials in, also in order to make better devices with higher coherence. We're going to see what coherence means later on. And, uh, and uh, after that, build uh, a computer. So integrating these, these single devices in a, in, a, in a computational unit, if you want. And from there, build a quantum computer and uh, show that we can actually achieve quantum advantage. So uh, show that we can actually uh, solve problems that are not solvable by classical computers. So first of all, what is a quantum computer? So uh, a quantum computer is a, is a computational framework that is based on quantum mechanical principles. So such as superposition of state and entanglement. So the building block of a quantum computer are the so-called quantum bits uh, that are the analogous of a classical bit, but is uh, quantum mechanical. And we call them qubits uh, for short. And um, a quantum computer perform gate operation, which means that uh, apply some type of uh, uh, signal to these qubits so that you can actually control uh, the state of the qubit. So zero, one, and you can actually flip the state of the qubit and you can control them in a similar fashion to what is typically done for a classical computer uh, with some modification because we are talking about a quantum uh, system. And then of course, each of these qubits is measured and uh, uh, the results of the measurement of each of these qubits gives a, a zero or a one, and then, uh, uh, and then a string of zero, one, depending on many qubits you have, of course. And um, the, the result of a measurement of a qubit is a probabilistic result. That is uh, um, the difference, the main difference compared to a classical computer, where instead it's uh, a deterministic type of, of measurement. You know, in this case, it's probabilistic. So anyway, so you can imagine that a classical bit uh, can have either zero or one, if you are familiar with classical computers, you can imagine them as a, as a coin where you have a head or you have a tail and you have state zero will be the head, state one will be the tail. And if you take uh, four classical bits and you put them together to form a register, you can actually represent uh, all these type of no numbers and for a total of 16 numbers. So if you take uh, two states for, for each bit, and you have n bits, you can actually represent a totality of 16 numbers, so two to the n numbers. For a quantum computer, it's kind of different. So again, you might have state one, state zero, state one, so your head and your tail, but at the same time, you can have zero and one together. And so you can imagine that as if you are flipping the coin, you're tossing the coin, the coin is flipping, and at that point, the coin is flipping and you, you don't have either zero or one is a superposition or a combination of the two. And so you can imagine a, a, a qubit working this way. So at this point, if we build up again, a register of four qubits, each qubit at this point can represent either zero or one simultaneously. So each register will be 16 numbers and therefore we can represent two to the two to the n number. So 226 numbers using just four qubits, which means that the number of numbers that you can represent uh, for the same amount of qubits compared to the same amount of, of bits is exponentially higher. And this gives you uh, a computational advantage. So what is a qubit, how it is made and how does it work? So a qubit could be anything. So whatever type of quantum mechanical system that can, pre can be prepared into different states can be actually a, 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 a qubit. So the, the simplest way you can represent a qubit, uh, we are physicists, so we, we, we typically like simple stuff. So a qubit could be like really, really a complicated thing, but at the end of the day, you can represent them as an electron, like in this way, where you have the spin of the electron. You can imagine the spin of the electron being uh, like a north and south pole of Earth, where the, the, the error like represented the direction between uh, uh, south and north. And you can represent that whenever the spin is up, for example, you have state zero, whenever the spin is down, you have state one. And whenever you have a combination of the two orientation, you have a combination of, of the two states. So at this point you can think of, okay, and then there are, as I said, different type of qubits. So you can see here, there is a large landscape, different, uh, different, uh, different uh, institution are looking at different type of, of architectures. 
And specifically, we are concentrating in uh, the so-called superconducting uh, uh, quantum circuits that are made basically of uh, integrated circuits made of superconducting materials. And uh, in this case, the actually really important feature of, or, the, or really important component for this, uh, for this type of devices is the so-called Joyson junction that I'm not gonna enter in detail, but that is like the most important uh, um, part of the, of, the, of the chip, if you want. And you can see here an electron image of the so-called Joveson junction, where the, the, the junction itself is this area here. And just to give you like a rough estimate, this is, a, this is, a, this is an area of the order of uh, 100 nanometer squares, uh, like to give you an example. And this is how typical circuits uh, looks like uh, looking them from the top. Anyway, so superconducting qubits operate at really cold temperature. So they are made of superconducting material. So you need to be at lower temperature. You need to be at a temperature lower enough so that you have uh, uh, the material behaves uh, as a superconductor. So the, uh, the, the, the conduction of electrons becomes uh, uh, dissipation less. And so what we use to operate quantum bits is uh, the so-called dilution refrigerator. So you can see here uh, um, uh, how the dilution refrigerator looks like. And the main point here is that this type of object uh, can go to really, really low temperature. It's like, a, imagine like a fridge that can go to temperatures that are lower than outer space. So outer space, we are talking about uh, of minus 460 Fahrenheit. Here we are going to uh, lower than that. So, sorry, <laughs> outer space is like minus 455 Fahrenheit. We're going to 400, minus 460 Fahrenheit. So it's colder than that. And, um, and so and we, we can control qubits. So we, we, we prepare qubits, we build them, we put them inside a dilution refrigerator, and then we can control them. And we do that with the microwave pulses. So you can see here, for example, that if we, we apply a pulse to, uh, of a certain duration to a qubit, you can see that the qubit flips, for example, starts from uh, the state zero and flips to a superposition of states. You can see that the evolution of the state of the qubit is perfectly deterministic. So depending on how long is the pulse that you're giving to the qubit, uh, that point you can control any type of superposition of states. So any type of combination of zero and one. And again, if you continue to apply the perturbation of the, the, the signal to the qubit, you can uh, completely flip the state of the qubit and go from zero to one, for example. And so, and uh, this is like the basics uh, or how you control qubits. So we control them by uh, sending microwave pulses of a certain duration. And we can actually control in the duration of the pulses, you can control the state of the qubit basically. And then we can do measurements. So per, to do measurements <laughs> in qubits, uh, uh, it's important to, to know that we are dealing with uh, something that is uh, of quantum mechanical, uh, has quantum mechanical behavior. So uh, in order to understand how measurement work, you should uh, uh, think about the, the story of the Schrodinger cat. So that is like a nice story that is typically is, uh, is told during uh, phys quantum physics courses at university. So let's assume that you pick uh, a cat, uh, a live cat, and you put them, put it inside a box. And inside the box, you put also, for example, a source of radiation. And, uh, and, um, and you can imagine that this source of radiation decays because of quantum mechanical effects. At this point, you, queue, you close the, the box. And at that point, since the, the and you can imagine that the, the, whenever these, uh, the source of radiation decays, uh, the, gut, the gut is gonna die basically. But the, the, uh, the decay itself of the radioactive material, it's a quantum mechanical process. And that is like a probabilistic process. And, and which means that whenever you have the box closed, you don't know whether the, the cat is dead or alive. It could be, and from the point of quantum mechanical point of view, as soon as the box is closed, the, the cat is actually in a superposition of being alive and being dead. You don't know. You're gonna know if the cat is alive or dead only when you open the box. And at that point, the cat is gonna be either alive or dead. And uh, from a quantum mechanical point of view, if you substitute your cat with uh, your qubit, at that point, you're gonna prepare a qubit in your state and then you're gonna open the box, you're gonna measure the qubit and you're gonna get a probabilistic result. A certain amount of time, you're gonna see the qubit in state one, certain amount of time in state zero. And building up statistics, you can understand uh, what was the state at which you were preparing the qubit. Anyway, so this is like the way it works, but we, you can see an example, for example. So let's prepare the qubit in state 60% uh, zero and 60 and 40% one. So the spin points that direction. At this point, we do a measurement and the measurement cannot give this outcome 
you cannot measure 60% and one, uh, 60 percent uh, zero and 40 percent one at the same time. What you want to do, your measure, your qubit, you're going to measure 60 percent of the time zero and 40 percent of the time one. And, uh, and this is exactly how it works for quantum computers. So you want to repeat your experiment or your, your, your algorithm several times so that you build up statistics and you can get your outcome. Uh, and so the result is probabilistic. So then what, what are we doing then in order to, to, to make these qubits better? What are the activities that we are doing as, as QMS? So I wanted to give you this, uh, this uh, introduction because I think it was interesting understanding a little bit how the quantum realm and quantum uh, uh, computing works. But so we are doing actually concrete activities in SQMS in order to improve this type of devices. And we want to improve these devices because they are actually fragile. In a sense, fragile whenever, and fragile probably is not the right word, but in general, let's assume that you, you prepare the, the state of your qubit the way you want, but then the qubit uh, uh, inevitably is gonna interact with uh, the environment. The environment could be electromagnetic noise, uh, materials that are actually dissipative, uh, temperature, cosmic radiation, uh, radiation, environmental radiation, and all these type of interaction are gonna make the qubit relax and lose information. So, which means that by losing information, you are basically introducing errors in your algorithms. And therefore you want to make this, uh, uh, this uh, rate at which you're losing information, at which your qubit relaxes, um, the, the, longer, uh, the longer possible. So you want the qubit to be stable as much as possible. So the main activity that we are doing in SQMS is indeed to study new materials, try to fabricate better qubits. And this is done by a closed loop where we, we fabricate a device, we, we measure it, and then we dissect it. And we look at it in detail. We do electron microscope, uh, microscopy, other type of techniques more sophisticated so that we can actually pinpoint the sources of dissipation, for example, and then feedback into fabrication in order to fabricate a better device. And the other uh, direction instead is to change completely the architecture uh, in order to build quantum computers. So uh, typically quantum computers are made uh, uh, bidimensionally, so with a, with a integrated circuit on a, on a silicon wafer. And that introduce, uh, has many positive aspects, but introduce several limitations. One possible way to overcome the limitation of a, of a planar device is to go to a three-dimensional device. And this is where our main expertise at Fermilab, that is uh, on these uh, superconducting resonators that are this three-dimensional structure that you can see here, that are typically used to accelerate particles they can actually be used also to uh, build quantum computers. So we figured out that, and you can build in principle really nice quantum computers. So uh, we decided to, to explore also this direction. And this is, I think, uh, what I, all what I have. Uh, this is now Silvia uh, time. <laughs> and she's gonna discuss about potentiality of quantum computers. Okay, so yeah, this goes, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you know, once we build these kind of devices, then uh, uh, there is a number of applications that uh, um, that, that, that can, um, can be revolutionary and can change the way we think about about them. So I'm, I'm going to, to just give you an overview on that. Um, so what is quantum computing is a source of new technology. Uh, we have governmental institutions that joined, uh, and, you know, for example, us, uh, we are for Fermilab, but it is also Argonne. Uh, and there is a number of uh, institutions that are funded by the government. Uh, there are industries that are developing uh, new science and new technology in the field. And Mattia just mentioned, uh, for example, Rigetti, who is a very strong partner, but actually there are uh, several startups. Um, and so it is a growing field and uh, um, there is a growing interest in the research and technology. And so, uh, from our perspective, it's also important that we have a new stakeholders joining in this. And this is why we think that also society, like common people in general, should learn about quantum computing and understand. Um, so quantum computing was funded by the government, by the Department of Energy with the 625 millions for new quantum centers. So five were awarded in 2020 and the SQMS was one of them. Um, so what is the social impact in general of quantum computing technology? So uh, what, what, for, for the reason that Mattia was explaining, so uh, quantum computers might be able to analyze and elaborate inputs in a faster and more efficient way. 
so that means that we can solve algorithms that uh, uh, for, for very complex problems uh, that could change and can be revolutionary in people's life and science. Uh, can make the inter com internet communication more secure, can transform economy and industry. And also, uh, you know, with quantum sensors, so we can have like better measurements uh, and sensitivity. So this is what I'm going to show you in the next slide. Um, so as, uh, as Mattia say, like, uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, classical, uh, classical computing, we have just a bit that can be a zero or a one. Instead of qubit, basically we have a, a sphere, which is called block sphere, and you can have an infinity number of states uh, around this block sphere. Um, what, what this plot is showing is, uh, you know, a graphical way uh, to understand why quantum computer can be revolutionary. So if we think about a problem that can be the number factorization of big numbers, uh, turns out it is a very difficult problem to solve for classical algorithms, but could be could be solved in a much more efficient way uh, using short algorithm that is, uh, is based on quantum computing algorithm. Um, so, and then uh, if we want to think about, you know, like, okay, so this is the theory, but then, uh, you know, when, when are we going to have a, a quantum computer available? We should think about the first calculators. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a picture of one of the first calculators, uh, probably in the 40s. Uh, and uh, it was as big as a room and the transistor was, uh, you know, several centimeters big. So, uh, and uh, <laughs> just uh, when we think about a bug, if we say that our computer has a bug, uh, it refers to a real bug that was in one of these transistors and uh, was bothering the computer. So just to give you the size of the problem. And now if we think about a calculator, we will have uh, like a, a, a iPhone or a smartphone that can make very complex, uh, uh, applications and uh, it is it is just a very small device compared to this first calculator. So just to say that right now here we are, uh, we have, uh, so this is a quantum computer um, at Fermilab and uh, this is, uh, this, you can see this, this is a superconducting cavity and uh, you can see these are like a basic element of our quantum computer. And uh, this is uh, a, like a, some basic instrumentation that you need to control a quantum bit. So of course, this is not an instrument that you can bring to your home or you know <laughs> that uh, you, you can all have, but maybe at some point, there, there are actually way that the people can, can, can use these systems. And uh, as we are hosted by the Italian uh, Cultural Institute, I would also like to point that INFN Gran Sasso, um, INFN in general, is also a partner of SQMS, and in particular with the facility at Gran Sasso, as Mattia was saying, we use this uh, uh, refrigerator because the quantum information is very fragile and uh, interact with the environment. So uh, at Grand Sasso, they have a cryogenic fridge, which is not only underground, but it's under a mountain. And so this is one of the most shielded places in the world. So eventually a qubit uh, under this, you know, very, very well shielded could live much longer. Um, and uh, this is like a scale up of the facilities in uh, SQMS. Uh, in particular, we have uh, the, um, uh, we have planned to add more fridges. So uh, um, have more computational uh, availability in our lab. And uh, um, this, uh, with the picture that you see here is a cryostat, uh, which is used for uh, HP high energy physics experiment. And is going to be converted in a, a very, it's a giant fridge is going to be six feet by six feet. So two meters by two meters. And uh, the other reason why I like these pictures is because you see uh, the cryostat here. And then in the background, there is uh, the CDF detector. Uh, if you are familiar with the Fermilab, you know that uh, um, this was a detector with a high uh, collaboration from Italy. And uh, um, so basically you can see not only the part of partnership with Italy, but also the technology transfers from uh, uh, high energy physics to quantum computing. Um, so when we think about a quantum computer, we say that there is a fridge, it is a very big structure, but this could be available to um, probably not single persons, but institutions uh, uh, through the cloud. So there are computers that are available through the cloud. There are several companies doing that, and one of them 
is uh, is Rigetti, and uh, probably we are also going in uh, in that direction. So about the applications, uh, um, one application is quantum crypto cryptography. So what does that mean? Using quantum algorithm, we are able to develop a very secure channel between two people that want to communicate. So Elisa is uh, sending a message to Bob and uh, this message can be only decrypted by Bob because Bob has a key to decrypt this algorithm. Now, why this is very secure? Because uh, if uh, a third party wants to hear about this information, uh, it, the, so not only the third party cannot because doesn't have the key, but eventually Bob will find out that the, the information is going to be corrupted uh, because there is something like called readout. So basically every time someone try to read out the state of a quantum bit is, uh, um, is somehow altering this state. And so this is why Bob will find out that Eve is trying to, to enter in the channel. He said that if you have just some classical or public communication up in the air, then uh, you know everybody who has the technology can just plug there. You, there is no like a specific key to enter the channel. So uh, we spoke about quantum sensors. So, so there are two parts here. One on the algorithm. So quantum algorithms can solve problems in a much more efficient way. So if there are uh, if there is a big amount of data that you want to analyze, then uh, uh, this can be done with the quantum algorithm in a much better way. And so you can uh, uh, understand and predict weather uh, uh, more efficiently and uh, perhaps build some weather patterns that are not possible with the classical applications. Um, and uh, another part is about quantum sensors. So you can have uh, these quantum sensors that are uh, sensible to the single photon level. So like really, little teeny tiny information and uh, this can perhaps help in uh, uh, analyze seismic event uh, volcano activities and perhaps even predict these activities um, another part is uh, chemistry and medicine again if you have a big amount of data then you can use quantum algorithm to solve this data in a more efficient way um, the mri the magnetic resonance uh, imaging analysis um, we, we may not think about that because it's a technology that somehow is available to all of us, but uh, um, to analyze uh, like these uh, little teeny tiny spots in our brain, it takes a lot of computing uh, um, uh, power. So again, with quantum computing, perhaps you are able to do this better and more efficiently. Uh, traffic management. So this is a project from Volkswagen there are actually cities joining a pilot program there, uh, like Beijing, Bar Barcelona, and Lisbon. I dropped the link here because it's a nice lecture. Uh, and uh, so the, the idea is always the same. You have a lot of inputs, you have a lot of data, and uh, uh, you want to be able to solve this data very efficiently. So here you can use quantum computing. Um, so about the quantum ecosystem and the workforce development. So of course, like a lot of these applications, we are uh, uh, we are already engaged with some institutions that are developed in some of these applications. But we are also available, you know, to expand our ecosystem and uh, and to have like bigger collaborations. So uh, we have a something called pilot programs uh, going to invest three hundred k per year to make our infrastructures available to, to the public and uh, for com commercialization and economic growth, incorporate SQMS into other government programs that are not currently funded, and also uh, like make the, this infrastructure more available in terms of open source. As I told you, like you can access perhaps a quantum computer on the cloud, so perhaps also this uh, uh, technology could be accessible. And then about workforce development, as uh, you know, this is an emerging technology, so it's a great chance for uh, you know bringing inside uh, like new and fresh minds and uh, brilliant minds. And so this is why we are supporting internship, uh, um, and we are very proud of uh, having uh, you know a fellowship. Uh, this is entitled to Caroline Parker, Beatrice Parker, 
with the first uh, African American women, African American known to have a, a postgraduate degree. So if you don't know her, I really encourage you to, to read her bio because it's a very interesting story. And then we have uh, summer schools, in particular with uh, Italy, with uh, the Galileo Galilei Institute. Um, so as a summary, so what we do, we bring uh, transformation advantages, bring together uh, national labs, industry, academia, build up on existing techniques from high energy physics to quantum computing. The challenge is to achieve, of course, very long coherence to have high scalability you know, putting two qubits together is not as easy as doing like one plus one, but it takes a lot of integration. Educate and training the next generation, develop a quantum ecosystem. And then Chicago is uh, a developing quantum hub. So there are uh, at least two national labs, uh, there are uh, universities and there are startups and industries that are in Chicago on quantum computing. So it's a very interesting to play, uh, to, to, to be for, uh, uh, it's a very interesting place to be for uh, this technology. Uh, yeah, this was the last one. We are opening the room for questions. Uh, in the room, if you can come close to the microphone, so you can the questions, so uh, people connected from Zoom, uh, we have a uh, Q&A button should be at the bottom right of your screen. You can type your question, or I don't know if you will unmute some people or to speak, the participants, or will they have to type the question? Type. So online, you will have to type. I'll break the ice first. Uh, I would like to thank Mattia and Silvia for this. So we haven't solved the mysteries of time and space yet, but <laughs> but uh, still you opened a little door uh, to onto the to this world of quantum. In question, I have I heard that this might be totally false, and maybe I'm not able even to express it in the right way. But there is a, one of the problems that you are facing with quantum computers is the is time. So how long the reaction is, is lasting? So if you can elaborate a, a little bit on this. Thank you. If you want to come here, probably. OK, yeah, yes, that is definitely true. So as we said during the, the talk, so quantum information is, uh, is not is short lived, if you want. So we have these uh, devices that can actually be encoded to, to, to store quantum information. But as of now, I would say the longest uh, uh, the longest uh, uh, lifetime for, for quantum information in a, in a type of qubit similar to what we are doing. So we're talking about superconducting uh, circuits is of the order of uh, hundreds of microseconds. So I would say probably 500 microseconds is uh, something like typical, like the longest that you can, you can get. And which means that again, uh, we need to, be, to do better devices, uh, study better materials to build devices and try to shield them as much as possible from the environment. Uh, by shielding, I mean, uh, as, uh, as Sila was saying, let's put like a, a big quantum computer underneath Grand Sasso, that could be a solution. The other solution could be, let's try to engineer uh, the quantum circuits so that to be uh, self-protected from the environment. So you can do that in, a cl in clever ways. And so, and so yes, I mean, uh, that, is a, that is a big challenge. <laughs> As soon as we solve that, then we're gonna have like quantum computers for everybody, I guess. I'm actually a follow up, Mattia, still for you. Um, so how many operation can you do? How many operation can you do on the qubit in that short time? Uh, that I think depends on the, I'm not really an expert in algorithms, but that depends on the algorithms, I, I believe. Uh, so an order of, <laughs> of 10. So if you want, if you want yeah. to answer, yeah, I, I don't have an answer. To this, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's not really something that you can measure because um, so this is also a tricky part about quantum computer. You cannot measure the computational volume of in a generic way. So you need to have an application. So for a specific application, then you can measure, uh, but for uh, it's there isn't just not uh, like a, a gener generic uh, generic way to do that. So. 
uh, there is actually also it, it's not only a sequence of simple gates or simple operation there is also something that is called optimal control in which you can uh, you can uh, develop very complex signals and uh, uh, arrive uh, like in, in any in any place into into the block sphere so unfortunately there is not a straight answer to, to your question mm -hmm. but another thing is if you have long coherence so if you have a long time then you, you are just able to fit more of these uh, these blocks one after the other so th this is one piece of the puzzle yeah there's another connected is i saw that from the picture that the the cavity right the sort of cavity seems to have a longer time one second so do you plan to build actually a quantum computer it's two seconds <laughs> two seconds you plan to build a quantum it seems also bigger device right yeah. so do you plan to build a computer a quantum computer based on cavities at fermilab how big would it be? How many cavities qubits do you plan to have if you plan to build it? Is there any idea? Yeah, so the, the, yeah, the idea is that uh, you have like a cavity, which is, you know, a big object compared to just a chip, uh, but it's more powerful in the sense of the efficiency because it's more efficient. Um, and it's also a way, a different way to do the measurements. It's, uh, you know, you, 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 Kind of reverse the the, the roles between the the readout and the qubit is complicated. So, um, so just uh, just to say that the so you can have also small cavities that might be like that. But these are like nine gigahertz cavities. So uh, the the you, you can engineer that part. Yeah, so, um, so it's true that the cavity is big. That's true. But as Silva was saying, you can actually reverse the problem and encode the information instead of inside the qubit, use the qubit to encode the information in the resonator. And so at that point, you can take advantage of the several resonant modes that the resonator have. And uh, at that point, you can actually build up, instead of having like a cavity that is one qubit, a cavity becomes, I don't know, hundreds of qubit collapsed in, in a single object. So again, it's not really easy to, uh, compare classical computers to quantum computers. In classical computers, you say, okay, I have this number of bits, and uh, that is uh, how much the, the system is powerful. With quantum computers, depends on the architecture, depends on uh, on the way you're going to to control the quantum computer. But in general, the idea is always the same. So the, the idea here is that we really don't care for making something small, because at the end of the day, you need to cool them down to this 10 millikelvin temperature. So you need a, a refrigerator to do that. So the way we envision a quantum computer is having like a big cluster, basically, to which you can actually connect remotely through a cloud and use it uh, uh, through a cloud. So uh, with the superconducting technology, at least that is most of the most advanced right now for, for quantum computation, it's difficult to imagine a quantum phone, for example, a quantum smartphone. That, that is something that uh, uh, is really, really complicated to imagine because you need, we need space for a refrigerator, basically. Okay, I think uh, I would like to have one more um, question to to Marco. Actually, this is going to be a very entertaining uh, webinar for people at home because we have been dancing with microphones. So, <laughs> but um, so I know that the Fermilab there is a cultural association of Italians at Fermilab, which is a um, uh, you organize cultural activities. And you are actually the president of CAIF. So I'm actually, I'm actually the, secretary. the secretary. The president is uh, okay. Professor Bellettini. Uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about this. Thank so you. yes, CAIF is the Cultural Association of Italians at Fermilab. Uh, we, we were organizing much more pre-COVID. So um, concerts or activities at Fermilab, there is a very nice auditorium or lecture uh, there at Batavia. And then we are collaborating also now uh, for events here at the Institute or, or, or in Chicago. Um, yeah, Silvia and, and Mattia are actually both in also in Kaif, like uh, and other, other people uh, at Fermilab. And uh, we, we will start now, uh, Fermilab slowly is reopening. So we'll start with activities also there and um, hope soon. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'll read the question. Um, so given the probabilistic nature of uh, quantum computing, uh, does it mean that you also get probabilistic results? For example, you might get a, a numeric 
result with a confidence interval around it. Or by controlling quantum computers, the final aim is to get a, a deterministic result, like a traditional number. So yeah, I mean, you're gonna get a probabilistic answer out of a quantum computer, but then depends again on the type of, uh, of, uh, of, of question you are asking to the quantum computer. For example, you can, you can actually, if you want to do like a really simple calculation could be, for example, calculate the, um, the orbitals of, for example, that are in the water molecule, for example, that is a quantum mechanical problem. And the answer is probabilistic because uh, you are defining the orbital is like a, a cloud of prob probability where you can find an electron around an atom. So these type of pro problems are like actually well suited to be solved by quantum computers. So uh, in that case, the result is probabilistic because it has to be probabilistic. And so I would say, uh, yeah, the, the results of a quantum computer is a probabilistic result, yeah. All right, then if there are no more questions, I would like to thank again uh, the audience who joined us, uh, Silvia, Mattia, Marco. It's been, actually we had traffic jams, rain, uh, construction works uh, on top of our heads. So as a first, uh, first um, live event in 20 months, it must be, I think it's all good signs. So thank you again, everyone. And also thank to Ari Cerca and all the board of Ari Cerca for, um, for cooperating on this with us. Thank you everyone.